is the one thing about you that will never change regardless of your success? God wants to know that because we have seen and God was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. So, number one, we said you must have the right, the right anchor. So, your action point here in your notes, please make a written covenant vow with God about your success. What will, who will you become when you're successful? So, in 2006, when I was working for Toyota, I was defining my success. And I came up with seven pillars. First pillar was spiritual health. Second pillar was family. Third pillar was career. Fourth pillar was financial health. Fifth pillar was mental health. Sixth pillar was physical health. Seventh pillar was legacy. What will people remember me for? And I spent that year just scripting my life along those pillars. What does financial success mean to me? And I was writing the ultimate. <clears throat> what does uh, uh, spiritual health mean to me? And I would script the whole thing, not for one year, but for the rest of my life. And then when I was done, I just had this strong unction in me asking the question, which of these pillars does not change? I thought by instinct, first of all, is family. Then I realized, actually, family can perish, isn't it? So what will happen if your family perishes? I looked at all the other pillars, physical health. You can be in great shape. You are the best athlete. Something happens. You're thrown off balance and boom. Okay. Everything was changing except one thing, the spiritual health. And as I sat there that morning, 5 a.m. in the morning, I just moved the spiritual pillar to the center and I wrote it, God. And everything settled at that moment. Because immediately I understood all the other pillars when I looked at them through who? Through God. So I said the first vow I made, and this is the vow that I made, like the one I'm asking you guys to make. I said, God, my relationship with you will never change regardless of how much you bless me. I don't care how, what I have. I don't care who I have. But my relationship with you will never change because of prosperity. Amen? That was really comforting. And that has anchored me for so many years. Then, I started seeing the other pillars, the financial, the family pillar. Say, okay, if I'm going to put together a family, then I'm, who must, I must I do it with? God, isn't it? I must get my kingdom family, isn't it? Eh? If it is financial, I must get my kingdom finances, isn't it? Eh? If it is relationship, I must get my kingdom. If it is my career, it must be a kingdom. Everything is what? Because who is at the center? God. So do you see why it's so important to make that vow? So for me, that vow I made 2006, it has never changed. I've never seen anything better. And God has held me accountable to it. And I have held myself accountable to it. So, the first secret source is what? The right, the right anchor. Let's go to the second one. Now, there's something so amazing that happens when you, when you make a vow to God. I realize, and you just, and, and I challenge all of you, go anywhere in the Bible where someone, a man of God, made a vow. 
Immediately, a journey began. Immediately what? A journey began. So, uh, in, the, in this book of Ruth, Ruth 1 verse 22, it says, uh, immediately Ruth vowed that Naomi's God will be her God. Yeah? It says, so Naomi returned in Ruth. In fact, the revelation that I got, the moment, the moment Ruth made that vow. Remember, Ruth was what? A Maobite. She was a foreigner, isn't it? Eh? The moment she made that vow, she ceased to become a Maobite. She became an adopted child of who? Of? Of Naomi. She took the place of her son. Before she was there because of her son. But now, her son was not there. She had made a vow herself. I will never leave you. Only death will ever. She became a part of that family. Okay. So, but what is so amazing, she made that vow and immediately they set off on a journey and they were coming, they were moving from a foreign land to their home. To their home. So there's something, there's something about being in a foreign land and uh, living on leftovers. And our home is only where God is, right? When you're, when you're not with God, you're not at home, isn't it? Eh? So our vow to God activates our journey to our redemption. And I mean all kinds of redemption. And I know here I'm talking about financial redemption, but I also represent the other pillars of redemption. Yeah? So those ones who are listening carefully, you can also claim the other parts of redemption, right? Sawa? So, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Maobite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest and that gives us the second key the second key once you make a vow to god he will bring you to the right place at the right time he'll bring you to the right place at the right at the right time and that's where the journey starts the journey starts to take you to the right place at the right so, why the right time? It says that they landed there in Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. What if they landed when there was still farming? Wrong timing, isn't it? So, God is, works things to perfection. Um, in 2004, 2004, yes, I was working for Toyota East Africa. I'm giving you my story and I'm giving you the story of Ruth. Eh? You like it? Eh? So 2004, I was working for Toyota and I was really working hard. I used to, I used to be in the office at 6 a.m. in the morning and I would leave at 10 p.m. in the evening. 6 to 10. Non-stop. And I would be there Saturday and Sunday also. And I remember walking, remember uh, Nakumat Mega? Outside Nakumat Mega, one morning, I was walking, 6 a.m., and I asked God, God, I trusted you for a job. Why did you give me a job that took me away from you? Because it had really, literally taken me away from him. There was no time for church. Everything was pressure. Pressure, pressure, pressure. So, as a, a, one of those days I was seated at my desk, one of my colleagues came and she asked me, Pius, can I have your CV? And I said, why do you need my CV? I'm barely a year in Toyota. And she said, don't ask me many questions. Just give me your what? CV. CV. I said, fine, you can never win against a lady, right? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I gave her my, my CV. But I did not know where it went. It went. So, a couple of weeks later, I was called. Hello, are you Pires? I said, yes. Uh, we are calling you from Centum. And we would like, it was not then called ICDC Investment. We are calling you from ICDC Investment. We have an interview scheduled for you. I said, what? <laughs> okay, I said, yes. And I was like, by the way, how did my CV get to ICDC Investment? Now call Centum. To cut the long story short, I did my interview in June 2004 and I was like, God, I mean, I, I am ba have barely settled in Toyota. It's a global organization, big brand, and I'm entering this small office called ICDCI and they want me. I'm like, hey, I don't think I'm done with Toyota. Now you see, I'm, I was conflicted. I finished the interview. I went back. Just as I was entering Toyota, I got another call. Say, hey, uh, hi, Pires. It is us again. We are calling you for the second interview next Friday. I said, okay. It's getting fun. Um, now I started understanding who is ICDC Investment. I started looking at who is the managing director, who are the managers. And now I was getting very curious because I was seeing really amazing people with great accomplishments. Now I really desired to go where? <laughs> to ICDC Investment. But that Friday, the very time I was supposed to be having my interview, the the top, the, the top most internal auditor in Toyota from Japan was in Kenya auditing my section. I told the lady who sent my CV, please call them and tell them, please reschedule my interview. She called them. There are only two people who are supposed to show up for that interview, me and another lady. The lady showed up. I was not there. They said, by the way, that guy called Pires, even he didn't seem interested. Let's just have this. So she was given the, she was given the job. Do you remember the first Kingsman Redeemer? <laughs> she didn't refuse. She took the job. <laughs> so she came on Monday. She, uh, in fact, it was James Mori who was handing over. He handed over work to her. She worked the whole morning. She went for lunch and never came back. <laughs> so they start, everybody started looking for her. She resigned on SMS. <laughs> <laughs> There's a song, I, there is a song that was raining those days. Akisema takubariki, akuna That was my song, yeah? So, these guys were so heartbroken, they even did not call me for the rescheduled interview. They said, we are going to start all over again and look for new people. That, those two guys were not interested. So, that was June. October 2004. I am outside Toyota, I'm leaving, 5 p.m., and I meet this manager of ICDCI now center. It's called David. He said, David is like, hey, Pius, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm good. He's like, we know, we called you for an interview, you didn't show up. I said, but I gave my apologies. He said, you know what? We recruited this person. She worked half a day, she left us, had broken. We were so disappointed. We decided to start the whole process all over again. We have been interviewing people, but until now we have not found the right person. So, he was like, are you still interested? I say, can you call me now? <laughs> <laughs> so, he said, don't be surprised if we call you again. So, sure enough, the following week, they called me for an interview. I, met, I went, I met the CEO, and uh, 
we, the CEO, <laughs> when I entered his office, he asked me everything about cars. Which car would you recommend me to buy? We spoke about cars and then he said, we are done. I, I said, we are done with interview or with talking about cars? <laughs> he said, we are done with interview. I said, okay. I went, later on I was told, he walked to the manager's desk and he said, we have found our man. And last November, I celebrated my 18th year in the center group. You must be in the right place, at the right, right place, at the right time. Was the right, was the right time June or November? November, November. isn't it? So, uh, <laughs> There's a few things to pick from, from this. How do you, so God will take you on a journey because you've made a vow. But you still have to depend on, on him. So there's something that Ruth did. Uh, chapter two, Ruth chapter two, verse two. It says, so Ruth, you guys have your Bibles. I wait for you. When you're there, say, ah, uh, So, verse 2 says, So Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. Now to glean, if you check the dictionary, it means gathering left overs. Okay? And she said to her, now Naomi, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to who? Now she's in the right, right place. Who was, the, who was of the family of Elimelech? Now behold, I like the way it starts, behold. Eh? Behold, Boaz came to Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they said to him, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is? I like AJV. Whose damsel is? Whose damsel is this? So, when you, God sends you on a journey, you must do something that truth did. You must go. You must go out. Remember, the story of Abraham started with what? Go. Even us, you must. If you stay in your house and you pray all you want to pray, you still not be activating your, your faith, isn't it? Eh? So, it's important that we pray, we get the instruction, and then we, and then we go. So, what, what are the takeaways for me? You must go out to the marketplace and work. I was just looking for work. I was just looking for work. I didn't know whether Centum would be the right place, but I was just out there looking for. If I didn't go for the interview, would I have been here? Today you'd have missed your king's financial redeemer. Can you see how the repercussions would have been great? You must do it. You must go. Go to the marketplace. Just work. For pay, for free, just do it. Just go. Just show up. If you go, God will lead you. He will lead you to the right field. He will lead you to the right field. Then, when you find the right field, there's something that Ruth did. She put in an outstanding work shift. She showed up there, they, they, they were saying, you, that lady, that one, she was easily noticeable. She put in, put in an outstanding work shift. And then someone will notice you. Just someone will notice you. So that is uh, key number two. Key number one was what? You must have the right 
And the, our anchor is who? Make our vow to, isn't it? Eh? Once we make the vow, he will send us on a journey. And now we'll arrive at the right place at the right time.